Time now for the After Five guest on the programme. It's wonderful to talk to this lady. It's uh, Julia Boyd. She is the author of a book called Travellers in the Third Reich. Julia, thanks for being my guest this afternoon. Delighted to be with you. Occupation of the Rhineland after World War One. Did the German people welcome tourists then? People first started going back to Germany about um, 1925. Cooks ran a tour to Oberammergau. I think that was the year when people really did start going back to holiday in Germany. The Rhineland, of course, was always a, a particularly popular place for the Brits to go because it was relatively close. They would drive to Aachen and enter Germany there and then drive up the Rhine, and um, it was a, always a particularly popular place for Brits, including uh, Philip Larkin, the poet's father, used to go there and take his family, I think, I don't know, about six or seven times in the, in the 30s. Can we jump forward to the 26th of February 1924 when Hitler was on trial for the um, failed Bierkeller Putsch yes. in Munich? Yeah. And, and the Manchester Guardian sort of called him the hero of the hour, a strange thing for a left-wing paper. Yes, unfortunately I couldn't find any uh, eyewitnesses apart from the Manchester Guardian uh, journalist. But I think the point was that you know everybody had assumed that after the failed Putsch that was Hitler done for, but he made such a, a, an impression at his trial and, and of course many people sympathized with what he was saying and the judge was obviously on his side so he really used his trial as a way to relaunch himself and he was only in prison nine months he really made the most of it to really advertise all his ideas and grievances and I suppose that was a, a major public relations success for him again I'm sorry I obviously need to keep jumping through the years. I do apologise for that, but September 1930, the Nazis win 130 seats. Did that then change the perception of Germany? But that was their big breakthrough election, yeah. yeah. Many Brits really felt they had more in common with Germany, certainly, than they did with France. Even after the First World War, there was a remarkable sense that the Germans were actually our cousins. Um, you know, even um, soldiers, officers who'd fought in the First World War got um, examples of them saying how much they preferred the Germans to the French. Mm. And I think many people felt that German culture and language was a sort of a central part of, of their education. So uh, by 1930, many people were feeling very sympathetic towards Germany, and a lot of people felt guilty about the Treaty of Versailles, where they felt the Germans had been treated very unfairly. So there was really uh, a growing sympathy for the Germans in 1930. Lord uh, Rothmere acclaimed him, even though the brown shirts were attacking Jews at the time. Mm. What, what do you make of that? Well, I, I don't think you can underestimate how much um, anti-Semitism there was in, in this country, in America, France, all, all over Europe. And I think there was a lot of perhaps what we would describe as casual anti-Semitism, I mean, in, in this country. People said the most outrageous things, but then when the Nazis started behaving really uh, appallingly and cruelly and... You know, there were the boycotts against Jewish shops, and when the, when the, as the persecution gathered momentum, then people like Maynard Keynes, for instance, who, who said terrible things about the Jews in 1926, but as soon as uh, the first refugees began arriving in England, he was one of the first people to go out and support them. So I think in this country there was this, this very sort of, uh, as I would say, casual anti-Semitism, which then, of course, people went into reverse when the persecution gathered pace. I was quite surprised earlier on when you said that the French were disliked as much as the Jews well, in Germany. I didn't they were disliked as much as the Jews. I said hmm. that many people preferred the Germans to the French. And there was an extraordinary, I mean, this was a surprise to me, and it sort of emerged out of my research, that uh, there was extraordinary sort of strong anti-French feeling in, uh, in America and, and certainly in this country. Of course, one has to remember that in America, something like 8 million Americans were, had German parents or grandparents after the First World War. So, uh, you know, there was a... And in this country, many people had been educated in Germany or had part of their education in Germany before the First World War. So there was this very strong feeling that they really were our, our cousins. I wouldn't say that people... I mean, of course, there are other people who, who love the French, people like Harold Nicholson. But it, it, it was a surprise to me how much anti-French sentiment there was. Yeah, I was going to ask you about um, Harold, Harold Nicholson because he was the author of Tark of the Otter, wasn't he? So, and oh, he, that was Williamson. Williamson, yeah. sorry, yeah. Yeah, yeah but, that was Williamson. Well, he was, um, he was extraordinarily naive. I mean, he, right. he did, as many veterans from the First World War, uh, were became very pro the Nazis because they wanted above all for there not to be another war, which is understandable. But they turned a blind eye, really. They concentrated on looking at what they thought were Nazi achievements. You know, Hitler was putting people back to work. 
um, in contrast with this country where the depression meant that there was a, a lot of unemployed. Hitler seemed to be reinvigorating his country. He was building exciting infrastructure. And there was, a, I think, something that is perhaps missed um, by us um, thinking about it after the war is that at the time, um, people traveling in Germany were very struck by the idealism they found, particularly in the young people who wanted to serve their country and their community. There was a lot of uh, idealism among the young that people found was missing back in, in Britain. Um, so I, I, I think, yes, I mean, um, it depended where you stood on the political spectrum. A lot of people who had right-wing views went to Germany and saw only the good things. Other people, of course, and not many left people, left-wing people chose to travel in, in Nazi Germany. But a lot of people went who were open-minded um, just because they were going for a nice holiday. And, of course, the Germans bent over backwards to be friendly, and, and they were, really wanted to get the Brits on side. Um, they really wanted the British to respect them and love them. And so they went out of their way to be kind and nice and helpful, and the hotels were clean and cheap. So you could go on holiday to Germany and really have a, a wonderful time. I mean, you might see lots of Germans marching around in uniforms, but that... Um, that didn't particularly worry many people. And they did see, of course, the anti-Semitic notices outside villages saying Jews not wanted and that kind of thing. But people, I think a lot of travelers to Germany in the 30s felt that that wasn't really their business. They may not like those sort of signs and the anti-Semitism, but they didn't feel it was their business to interfere. And even uh, former Prime Minister David Lloyd George um, kind of sang Hitler's praises, didn't he? He was extraordinary. He absolutely, I mean, he was... So obsequious to, to Hitler, and the letter he wrote to him after he'd met him um, is makes your sort of skin crawl. <laughs> I, I mean, really unbelievable. Um, but I think he, you know, like many retired politicians, they were sort of hankering after his days of greatness. And Hitler absolutely knew how to flatter his ego, and he fell for it, which it was not uh, his finest art. So here we are in 1937. Um, the regime is now tightening a hold on the nation. Tourism is still coming in, and the Jews are leaving. Didn't they see these Jews leaving? Um, yes, well, they, they were, of course, leaving. But a lot of Jews didn't leave. I mean, I would have thought after 1935, uh, when the um, Nuremberg Laws were introduced, which um, stripped Jews of their citizenship, you would have thought that everybody would have tried to get out. Of course, many did. It wasn't that easy. You had to get a sponsor, you had to have some money, you had to have somewhere to go. Um, and I think many Jews felt that Hitler simply, you know, would, couldn't survive, but, you know, it would, it would change. But I would have thought by 1937, um, to be Jewish in Germany, you would have seen enough to know what uh, was in store. Did you find out many tourists were in Germany when war was declared on Poland? There were still some people, um, and the extraordinary thing is how many young people were travelling around in Germany. Curious enough, my own mother was studying Germany, and she was there for six months in 1938, and mm -hmm. back again in Germany in the summer of 1939. And her, her, I mean, her parents were absolutely anti-Nazi, and her father sponsored a Jewish friend of hers, and yet, you know, one is, is astonished that they would allow their 17-year-old daughter oh. to be wandering around mm. Nazi Germany in 1939. But she wasn't alone. Um, the Americans sent a lot of their young students to Germany to have a sort of year abroad. And uh, you, you, one, I just find it, it was one of the things that surprised me most in the course of my research, that, that so many young people were in Germany uh, so soon before the war. That's my after guest today. That's Julia Boyd, and the book is called Travellers in the Third Reich. Thank you. Bye bye.